it can be tempting to think of the brain as a computer. Digital computers process information by harnessing a network of billions of on and off switches called transistors. And for decades, neuroscientists believed the brain functioned in much the same way, with neurons playing the part of these simple switches. In this understanding of the human brain, neurons themselves weren't intelligent. It was the entire network of 100 billion neurons that made the human brain the most advanced information processing machine in the known universe. Or so we thought. In the 1980s, a more complex picture began to emerge. We learned that neurons aren't all the same. When stimulated, individual dendrites can express different voltages. This was the first clue that dendrites could be processing information independently and that our biological computing system might be more powerful than we thought. This is Yota Poirazi. A paper she co-published this year reveals just how much we underestimated neurons and dendrites. So when Matthew Larcom in his lab discovered the presence of some peculiar types of the dendritic spikes, he came to me and we discussed what could be the functional role of these spikes. So the main difference of this type of spikes uh, compared to the ones we know already is the stronger the stimulus, the smaller the amplitude of the dendritic spike that they discovered. This is something that had not been seen before in other types of animals, and we didn't know what could be their uh, functionality. Poirazi built a computational model of neurons as a two-layer network, where dendrites functioned like processors within processors. We designed uh, the model so that it would reproduce this decreasing amplitude behavior. What does this mean? It means that as you give the model a stronger excitatory stimulus, the output of the model should get smaller. And we wonder what could be the computation that would benefit from such a feature. And we thought of exclusive OR. The exclusive OR function, known as XOR, is a complex logic gate commonly seen in neural networks. It yields a binary output of 1 if one but only one of the inputs is 1. In other words, a signal is only passed on when it is graded with the right combination of inputs. Mathematical theorists thought an entire network of neurons would be required to compute the XOR function. And the main novelty of our work is this is no longer true. If you have a neuron that implements this type of a specific transfer function that is produced by these dendritic spikes, then you can solve the exclusive order problem without requiring a large network. So while it may be tempting to think about the human brain as a computer, it's maybe more accurate to think about it as 100 billion tiny supercomputers. Our individual neurons are much more powerful than the other types of neurons we've seen before in other types of animals. And this could in turn contribute to our increased cognitive abilities as humans. Where does one individual end and another begin? On the surface, this seems like a simple enough question. But for biologists, it's not so straightforward. Viruses need host cells to replicate. Slime mold amoebas spend part of their lives as a single cell, and other parts as a massive colony that moves like a single organism. Why is the natural world clustered into little ordered patches that we call organisms? Why is that? That's David Krakauer. He and his colleagues at the Santa Fe Institute completely reimagined individuality. Their new theory, called the Information Theory of Individuality, argues that individuals are best thought of not in spatial terms, but in temporal terms. We would argue that it's more general, that it's actually more profitable to focus on how information flows forward in time than the particular matter that the information is carried by. Individuals are not a static thing. They're actually processes, right? So an individual is a process. And that's a very different way of thinking about um, fundamental units in evolutionary biology than, um, than we've seen in the past. The theory operates according to three principles. Individuals can exist at any level of biological organization, from the subcellular to the social group. Individuality can be nested, with one individual living inside another. And it exists on a continuum which means that entities can have different degrees of individuality. This is a kind of more fluid and continuous notion of individuality that encompasses potentially a broad range of phenomena um, from physical systems through the biological. There are three kinds of individuals. The first is shaped by environmental factors, but contains most of its information internally. 
This is what humans and mammals are. The second is the colonial form, which involves a more complicated relationship between internal and external factors. The third type is driven almost entirely by the environment. Stanislav Lem wrote a beautiful short novel called Solaris that was made into a wonderful film by Tarkovsky. And in that, an entire planet is an individual. The entire ocean is sentient. And that's so counterintuitive to us. We couldn't imagine something that vast and that fluid having this property, but why not? And I think these kinds of formalisms might allow us to detect individuals that are very distributed and don't conform to our expectations based on biology. It may seem like a truism that sleep loss is bad for your health, but we know surprisingly little about why. Scientists still don't know, for example, why animals who are completely deprived of sleep die even more quickly than when they're starved. Dragana Regulia's lab at Harvard University studies the effects of sleep deprivation. We thought that if we deprive animals of sleep and if we see that there's an effect of survival and then we dig around the entire body in an unbiased manner, there's a chance that we may uncover some kind of cellular uh, dysfunction or damage that could explain why um, sleep is required for survival. These are scans from the small intestines of flies that were kept awake for 10 days in Regulia's lab. That neon buildup is a material called reactive oxygen species, or ROS. So you could see that there is really extensive damage, extensive oxidation of gut molecules that follows accumulation of reactive oxygen species. So you can see damage to DNA, for example, and you can see cells dying. This thing that was happening in the gut immediately preceded the time when animals started dying. So that was a pretty um, uh, strong indication to us that this might not be just a correlation, but might be, might be causative for uh, the demise of animals that happens during sleep deprivation. Regulia and her lab were able to replicate their findings in mice. This suggests that a fundamental job of sleep is to regulate the ancient biochemical process of oxidation. Oxidative stress is a consequence of sleep deprivation, and the gut is um, specifically impacted by sleep loss. And then that makes you think in general about the gut, kind of its very special role that it, that it um, probably plays in, in our lives right now, and also that it has played in shaping um, animals throughout evolution. Thank you.